Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dungeon Dive. Daniel here. I hope you are doing well, and if you're not, I hope you are soon. Okay, today we are going to take a look at Wayward. Uh, this is a game designed by Bruce Hurst, and I want to thank Bruce for sending me a copy of this game after I requested one for review. I remember when this game uh, kind of first came out, it was on my radar, and I took a look at it, and I dismissed it as being too simple. Um, it seemed like a kid's game. And I think at the time, I was into more complex games, heavier uh, style games, perhaps. Or I wanted things that were bigger and more grander and would allow me to get into them more. But as the viewers of the Dungeon Dive have probably started to notice over the last couple, three years... I have been gravitating away from heavier or bigger, I should say bigger games, and been gravitating more towards simple games. And um, a Dungeon Dive uh, viewer and a uh, member of the Facebook group, uh, Steven, he, he asked me, he said, hey, have you ever checked out Wayward? And I was like, oh my God, I completely forgot about this game. So thank you, Steven, for reminding me of this game because I am so happy that I have this game now. I love this game. It is awesome. It is an ultimate indie game for one thing. Uh, the game doesn't even come in a box. It comes in a shipping box. I cut out the sticker that was put on the shipping box just so I could have this uh, sticker art here. The pieces come in a Ziploc bag. Uh, the board is a double-sided uh, vinyl poster, and the uh, tokens are like little plastic tiddlywinks. And not only is it an ultimate uh, indie game, DIY game, but it is also perhaps the ultimate beer and pretzel dungeon crawl. At its core, this game is a competitive game in which the players are moving through this dungeon. On the other side of this board is a more advanced town map, and we'll take a look at that a little later. But at its core, it's a competitive game where the players are moving through this dungeon, trying to pick up items such as weapons, armor, lockpicks, torches, tokens, tarot cards, and hourglasses. And going into certain rooms and competing against the board in certain events and trying to pick up the gold, the player with the most gold who escapes the castle at the end of the game is the winner. In many ways, this game reminds me a lot of kind of a family version of Dungeon Quest. And I think that really is the perfect way to describe Wayward. And you guys know how much I love Dungeon Quest. I, and like this game, I just, this is one of those games where I wish I had like a couple kids who were 10 or so years old. And I know that we would just get so into this game. However, I also am going to uh, force my game group. Uh, I got a couple guys coming over. We're all like in our 40s and we are definitely going to be playing this in a couple nights because this game is just so much fun. It's not just a kid's game, even though it is simple. What it really is, is just simple fun. And it also has one of the best looking boards I have ever seen. I know that I will be using this map for many, many solo adventures to come because of all of the art and how you could very easily use the art to trigger certain kinds of events. We've got like these plants here coming out of the sewer grate, uh, grabbing this guy, some monster plants in there, uh, some kind of uh, crazy statue there, or this uh, mausoleum here with all of these uh, sarcophagi. Um, over here, we have a cemetery. We have some kind of kraken beast in there. Over in this red area, perhaps, are some, some torture devices. Um, a jail over in that corner there. We have uh, some a little uh, sleeping chamber over here. And here we have like the wizard's quarters 
where some kind of a uh, crazy ritual is going on in that room. And just take a look at this water. My God, that is like the best looking water I have I've, I've ever seen drawn. I, I don't know. Is, is that like a photograph? I don't know. Bruce did all of the art and, and all of the design. And I am just I am in love with the way this game looks. It is so bright and colorful and it just adds to that sense of wonder because part of the game is actually looking at the map because you are looking for these items that have a soft halo to them. These axes are uh, weapons that you can pick up to help you overcome challenges. The gold has a little soft halo and that's gold that you want to pick up. If the gold is small, uh, a small pile, it usually means that you have to do something to get that gold like not uh, wake up the dragon or fight one of these guards to get the gold. If the gold is big like that, you just kind of have to use an action to pick it up. There are also these lock picks and the lock pits, the lock picks are kind of a little mini game. You want to pick those up. Those are the tarot cards over there. Um, oftentimes you will need the lock picks to open up doors to get inside and grab these hourglasses, which are going to give you more actions on your turn. And then there are, there are also these uh, shields, which will give you armor. And then some of the rooms are special rooms and they are uh, signified by these uh, lit braziers there and a letter. And then in the manual, which is a big manual, big black and white manual, you can look up that room and it'll tell you the kind of mini game that you have in the room. So there is there are rickety bridges scattered across and rickety bridges. You can um, you can cross those rickety bridges, but you have to roll 3d6 and you have to add the total. And that's the number of items you can carry across or else the bridge breaks. And if you have more items than that uh, on your character sheet, then you have to discard some of those in order to get across safe. Uh, there's a wishing fountain that you can uh, roll. And a lot of the little mini games are like press your luck games where you usually roll a D6 on a roll of a one to two, you usually lose something or you don't get something and then a higher roll you win. But some of them are a little more complex than that. Uh, there's a fighting pit where you can go into this pit here and you can choose to fight uh, one of the guards. And if you beat the guard, you get their money. And then you can continue fighting other guards in order to get more money. There is uh, this room here that's kind of like the, these watchers. And the way that the end of the game triggers is at the beginning of the game, you're going to put this token here, this marker here on 100. And as soon as a player passes that threshold, that triggers the end game. And um, as soon as a player ca uh, gets 100 gold or more, that triggers the end game. And at that point, everybody has one more turn to escape from the castle with their gold or else they lose the game. However, these watchers here, every time a player enter the, uh, enters that room, that gate is going to be moving down. So that gate, the uh, end goal, the trigger for the end goal can actually change during the game. And you really need to be aware of where you are in the dungeon and make sure that you have the necessary items or strength and skill to escape from the dungeon. Um, in this uh, room here, there's this, what is that room called? The, um, the coffin room here. When you're up on this ledge up here, you are going to go to these uh, little these little levers and you're going to spend an action to pull those levers and you're going to roll three dice and you can assign those dice to any of the numbers one through 12. You can combine them. You can say, okay, I'm going to get the number 12 to get this hourglass here and then you could assign this number five to get a torch and some gold. So that's one way that you can get those items there. Um, if you have torches, you can use torches to take shortcuts from these large staircases. So you can go from here to here or from here um, over to this purple area there. And you have to use a torch in order to use those secret passages. There are also these docks here and the docks, you have to spend a token, one of these tokens, and then you can move from one dock to the other. And you need to think about having to tokens and having torches to plan your escape route if you're deep inside the dungeon. Now, the cool thing is that the way the actions work, it's so simple and it's also a lot of fun because at the end of your turn, uh, the next player gets to pick up all of the action uh, tokens with this little magic wand. And they are um, 
magnetize. And I'm telling you what, this is a total gimmick. And I feel silly for saying this, but as a 47 year old man, I have absolutely loved using this, ma <laughs> this magic wand to pick up these action tokens. It's so satisfying and so simple. Such a neat, just way to interact with a dungeon crawl that I've never seen before. But anyways, let's take a sample turn here. So at the beginning of the game, you're going to uh, roll a D6 and you will start in the number that you roll in, in the room. And so if I was this character here, I would be starting in room number two. And everybody on their turn is going to have uh, 12 action item, 12 action uh, chips that they can spend. And you just, you spend one action chip to pick up all the items in the room. So if I were here, I could spend one to pick up three gold and a shield. Okay, so I add those. I would um, add those to my character card. I would add um, a shield, which is armor. And then I would move up on the gold track uh, to three. And then you spend one to move out. And then from here in this room here, there is two gold. So I could spend that to add two more gold. I would move my guy, my uh, score guy up two more. And then I can move somewhere else. Now I want to try to find some weapons or possibly some lock picks. The lock picks are really good to find. So you want to look around the board and try to plan your route. Um, I know there is a two lock pick over there. But to get by that guard, I need some weapons so I can fight the guard so I can push through the guard. And I need to try to find some axes on the board. Let's see here. Um, to move through this, to move through the green barriers, these are like traps. And so those cost that m number of, uh, of armor. So a two trap, I need to spend two points of armor to move across that threshold there. But uh, there is an item there. There's a, an axe there that I could potentially get. But let's see how I can get across there. I'm going to go through the guard room, the fighting room. So I'm going to uh, place another action point there. I will move into there. I'm not going to fight because I don't have any weapons, so I can't fight any of the guards. So I'm going to spend an action to move out. Now I am crossing the bridge. Right now I only have one item, so I can't really lose any items. But if I had more, I would roll the dice, add that up, and then that's how many items I could take across the bridge. So now I am across the bridge here. And I want to move into this room here. I'm going to pick up all the items in this room, which is a weapon and a token. That token will allow me to use the uh, docks here. So I'm, I'll add a weapon and I will add a uh, token to my character sheet. And I'm gonna move out and I'm gonna move out of here. And I'm in here, so I'm going to pick up two gold. I would add two more to my score. Now this guy needs a four in order to get by him. I do have one weapon, so I could use one weapon. And to do that, I'm saying I'm going to try to push past the guard, and I have to roll. Uh, I have to meet or beat a four. All right, a six. So I did it. So now I can move into that room. You only have to push past the guards when they are facing you. I can move back out and not have to face that guard again. However, if I rolled a one, I not only would I have failed, but I also would have broken my weapon. Now, as you can see, some of the guards have a, a, a seven or an eight, and those have red numbers. If you see a red number, that means you have to have two weapons, and you have to roll two dice, and you have to add those together in order to uh, push past that guard. But that's a really cool room there, because you can get a lockpick, number three. You can get two gold and a tarot card. The tarot cards you can spend to re-roll a d6. Okay, so now I'm going to spend another action point, and I am going to move into there. So that was my last action point. So then I would uh, hoover up all of the action um, tokens there and I would pass that on to the next player. But let's say it was uh, the, the red player's turn again. Okay, so now that everything has been cleared up, now I can go back and I could pick up things again. Once you have placed a token in a room, you can no longer really interact with that room in any other way except to move through it or past it. So you can't just keep placing tokens down to pick up the same items over and over again. But on subsequent turns, you can move back in to pick up items because there are no red tokens. Basically, anywhere where a red token is, that kind of shows that that room has been looted for that turn. Okay, so now I would move out here. I can move into here. But since I moved into here, 
um, the, the watchers are going to move the gate. And so there is this handy cheat sheet here. So watchers, roll a die and move the gate marker down by that amount. So I could roll a die there, a four. So now the end of the game is going to trigger one, two, three, four at 96 gold instead of 100 gold. But where was I going? I was trying to get over here, but I think I need to pick up another weapon along the way. Okay, so I'm going to move out of the watcher room into this room. I'm going to pick up that weapon. Okay, so now I have two weapons to fight with. And I'm going to move back here. I'm going to move into here. Now that guard is facing that way, so I can move past him. I can run past him without fighting. I'm going to pick up that two gold. Okay, so I would add two gold to my score tracker. Then I'm going to, need to move out. Then I'm going to cross the bridge. But now I need to roll. Now I have one, two, three. I have four items. So I could roll really low and lose an item. But no, we're good there. So I'm going to uh, place that there to pick up the uh, piece of armor that is on that space there. Okay, and then I'm going to uh, move into this hall there. And now I'm going to challenge that guard. I am going to, well, see, I could move into here with one chip left, but then I wouldn't be able to pick anything up. Because if I pass the guard, I wouldn't have any, I can move in, but I wouldn't be able to pick anything up. You want to think about where you are ending your turn so you can do the uh, that room at the end of your turn and at the beginning of your next turn. But let's just say for this example, I am going to fight the guard. So I need a five or higher. I have two weapons, so I can choose to fight with both weapons. But these guys, you don't add. These guys, you just need it on one single strike. And a four and a one. Okay, so I did roll that one. So that means one of my weapons is broken. So I have to discard that token from my uh, board. And the game just continues like that. And you want to move around the board. You want to think of uh, good routes to take so you can get the items you need. So you can uh, manipulate the game in such a way to pick up the most uh, the most gold, and you and you also want to utilize the special rooms, and you want to continue to press your luck to get that gold, and all the while you want to think about where you are as the uh, the player in the lead is approaching that threshold. You want to think about where they are, where you are. And to make sure you have enough things to get out. Because the way to get out of the uh, dungeon is right here. But that is guarded by an 8 power do uh, guard. Or a, uh, a, a lock pick. A locked door that takes 6 uh, points of lock picking. Or you can challenge the wall of fire. To where if you go here you have to roll dice to move. And if you land on the spots without fire you are safe. But if you land on a spot with fire, you have to spend a point of armor to keep going. If you don't have armor, that'll push you off the wall into the room below. And if you make it through the wall of fire here, then you can collect that 10 gold at the end and you can bypass the 8 power guard and the 6 power lock and get out that way. The lock picks are pretty interesting because the doors that need lock picks have these little dots on them. And the lock picks are numbered 1, 2, and 3. In order to open up a one dot lock, you need the one lock pick. For a six, you need all three lock picks. For a four, you need the three and the one. For a five, you need the three and the two. This one over here is six and you can get 12. And the lock picks don't break, so you can continue to use those from turn to turn. Uh, finally, sometimes you will gain a random item, in which case you roll a d6 and you will add an item depending on the so on a 1 to 2, you get a weapon. On a 3, you get some armor. On a 4, you might get a lock pick. So if you roll the 4, then you would have to roll again. And if you roll the 1, 2, or 3, you would get that lock pick. And then if you roll the 5 or a 6, you could get an accessory. And if you roll again, if you roll a 1, 2, 3, or 4, you get the associated accessory. But if you roll a 5 or 6 again, you get nothing. Just like Charlie. Um, but yeah, this game is super fun. I have only played it solo so far. I've been playing it uh, just two-handed, uh, pink versus blue. And I've been playing it all day. And for such a simple game... I have been having so much fun just looking at all the cool stuff. Like if you want to uh, pick up that 12 gold, if you move into here, you have to have three armor so you can uh, dodge that that giant like troll hand or something there. But it's all of the little guys who are like trapped in places. 
Uh, this guy trying to scale the uh, the wall of fire over there. Uh, this guy, he's like in an infirmary, but he's being guarded by some kind of goblin. Um, it's kind of like a Where's Waldo dungeon crawl board. I've just been having so much fun looking at it. Um, the game calls itself a choose your own adventure, and it kind of is a choose your own adventure. It's a choose your own adventure in pictures and actions and not in words. And because it is kind of like this open world dungeon, I mean, this is kind of like, this is kind of like Dungeon Crusade, an open world dungeon where you can go anywhere and do anything and encounter the spaces in the order that you want to. So it, it, it is, a I, I, I hesitated when I first saw that choose your own adventure. I was like, well, I don't know, does it really feel like you're choosing your own adventure? And yeah, you know what? It really does because you have... 12 things that you can do on each turn and you need to make really wise choices to progress through the game and win. Uh, one final thing is sometimes you will get a cursed item and if you get a cursed item you take a black chip and you have to put that on uh, a space and it covers up that space for the rest of the game. So you might go through a whole game without torches, you might go through a whole game without tarot cards, you might have two spaces of your armor that are cursed, and that is a really, really deadly. But I'm going to take a quick pause here. I'm going to flip the board over to show you the uh, town side on the on the other side of the map here. Okay, so here is the town side, and um, Bruce calls this a more advanced map, and that's because it is more cluttered, and so it's harder to see the things that you are looking for, and that's done on purpose to make sure that you really have to pay attention to your route. On this map, all the players start in the little uh, center here, the, the, the um, entrance to the city. And then that is also the way you have to get out. There's an inn here, which you have to brave as like a big bar fight inside here. And you have to uh, pass through like a gauntlet of fighters over there. There's a jail that you can end up in. There are secret passages. You can also pay uh, guild tokens in order to uh, use these secret tunnels here. And you can, uh, there's these guild masters and they're pointing at each other. So this red guild master is pointing at this other uh, red guild master. So you can spend one of your tokens to go from this ladder over to that ladder and vice versa. There is a catapult. You can take catapult rides. So if you spend an action there on this catapult, you roll 2d6 and you might end up somewhere else in the game or in the on the board or even outside the wall. If you roll an 11, that is one of the ways to escape at the end of the game. Um, you also might end up on this rooftop here, which is the only way to get up here. But that's 10 gold up there. And there's this guy hanging on on the roof up there. Then after that, you can come down into one of the other rooms there. Uh, there's a weapon shop and a, and a, a place where you can uh, pickpocket people, um, a little item shop and all kinds of cool things. A little goblin fighting ring where people fight their goblins. Um, all kinds of cool things to see and do in this awesome city map. I, 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 um, I emailed Bruce and I asked him if he would ever consider just making maps for, for people to play solo RPGs on. Because what I really like is how you have spaces to move, but then also the art is really good for triggering things. Like, you know, a guard here and it has a four. So when you're playing like a solo RPG, you could say, okay, this is always going to be like, you know, some kind of challenge, like a medium challenge, um, you know, uh, some kind of uh, an altercation there. So you would know that when you pass this bridge, you know, you need, you need to roll up on a certain chart in order to do something. You can come into this tavern and there's a bar, there's a brawl going on. So you could participate in the brawl. Um, over here, there's a gambling hall there. So you could uh, uh, participate in some kind of gambling. Uh, there is a lot of pressure luck in the game. There are ways to mitigate some of that luck. Uh, sometimes you are just going to have bad luck and that's just the kind of game it is. But like I said, it is kind of like the ultimate beer and pretzel dungeon crawl or city crawl. And one of the reasons why I think that is because there are so few components. You don't need to have, you don't have, there's zero decks of cards to deal with. I mean, you can literally have this game set up in, in like less than a minute you can have it put away in less than a minute because all you're going to be doing is dumping all your components in <laughs> in this Ziploc bag and hanging up. I, I'm like hanging up this vinyl 
uh, poster here. It is very thin vinyl. It's just like a vinyl poster. So just know that going in. But um, yes, I am so stoked on this game. It is so much fun. It is so simple and fun. And I am really looking forward to introducing it to friends. I think that people with the right group, somebody who just appreciates a really simple time, but knowing that you have to really think about how you're going to be moving through the dungeon, moving through the city, using your chips wisely, landing in opportunity, uh, having creating opportunity for yourself to get the most points and also to plan your escape route. So it's not exactly brainless. It's just simple fun. So all right, guys, well, I hope you enjoyed taking a look at Wayward and we will talk to you later. Bye bye.